Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. Today's video, we're just gonna do a little bit of talking and I wanna get this out here so I can get some extra opinions and stuff and see what everybody thinks. And uh, it's just gonna be about finally getting some heat in the house with our radiant floor system. Okay, so first off, here in the garage, uh, with the weather being pretty cold at night, I think the lowest we've seen so far is about 28 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's just amazing in here. It really never gets cold in here, but the temperature swings do take forever. So for example, if it's 28 outside, it's still like 50 something in here. But if it heats up, like in the summertime, I've noticed if it heats up to like 90 degrees outside, in here it's still like 60 or something because it just takes so long for it to heat up and cool down in here. And if you guys don't remember, this wall, wall right here, that is all ICF. The walls over here on the other three sides, those are zip boards or zip panels, which is an R6.6. .6. Then we've got the studs. So the studs don't have that thermal uh, transmission. They've got a thermal break there where the heat can't transfer right in and out of them because of that R6.6. .6. Then we use two by eight studs. We've got at least five to six inches of open cell blown in um, inside of the cavities. So there you're looking at close to like an R19 plus the 6.6 .6 plus a little bit of the drywall, and then plus the three eighths of LP smart siding. So if my math is correct, we've got roughly in the cavity, somewhere close to 28 to 29 on the R value, again within the cavity. And then at the studs, you're looking at uh, probably only an R15. So that's pretty good. I mean, an R15 at my studs, uh, I think code in Ohio is you have to have an R15 within your cavity. So for us to be that high, the temperature swing in here is very, very uh, long. It takes a long time for it to move. The doors, I think, are an R13. The ceiling, we did 30 uh, rock wool, an R30 at seven and a half inches thick, I think. And then we blew in some closed cellulose uh, insulation, which got us up to an R49. I didn't go crazy on the ceiling. R49 is code. The garage is not that big of a deal. So the house, we're gonna blow in an R60. But to just meet code out here in the garage, again, temperature swings are very long here. Um, and I don't know, when it gets negative five outside, it'd be interesting to see if we don't turn on the radiant heat, just how actually cold it gets in here. And I wanna go ahead and say that it probably won't even freeze out here. And the reason why that is also is Aaron started parking in the garage again. So if Aaron's car comes in here every day from you know coming into work, you've got this you know engine block that's two plus hundred degrees. It's kind of creating a little bit of heat in here while that dissipates and it might actually bring the temperature up or keep the temperature kind of stable that uh, uh, it actually won't get the freezing in here. So I don't know, that, that'd be interesting to see again, to wait till it gets to negative five outside and to see if the car engine as it cools down can give a little bit of a heater function. And again, just see how bad it actually gets. But nonetheless, it is start. it, it is time to start talking about the radiant tubes here. So uh, real quick, first thing I had to do, unfortunately I did have to remove the PVC sleeve that was going through the wall. So we'll have to spray foam that and then re-mud it and uh, uh, paint it and all that stuff to make that look pretty. But uh, I, I only intended that little PVC pipe there to be used as a gas line because I thought a boiler had to stay out here. Um, and I thought I needed a boiler for like every zone, which obviously you don't, you just need more pumps. So not a big deal, knock that sleeve out. Now we've got three quarter of, of an inch PVC coming out here. We'll go on down that wall, come on over, and then we'll bring in two manifolds right here. Now what I'm debating and what I wanna see what people think about this is I don't understand why the manifolds have to have on off switches on them or valves. Why can't you just put a manifold out here and just have the manifold completely open? 
Each one of these runs is basically equal. They're all under 300 feet. We probably cut a good 20 feet or more off of each run. So we're looking at roughly 280 feet per run. There's only three of them out here and there's no need for me to ever turn a valve all the way off or turn a valve down or buy those really, really expensive manifolds where you can spin down the gallons per minute and stuff off of each one with the gauges and everything. To me, manifold right there, I could literally just get a uh, PEX plastic manifold for three runs each and they're five dollars if i wanted to make it out of copper i could go up to like fourteen dollars but then again you can go all the way up to like two hundred dollars with those controllers and stuff but out here in the garage what do i really care if i need to shut that down or close it down or this that and the other i just don't see the point so let me know what you guys think how about a five dollar uh i do have to use clamp pecs on these ones but I can use expansion on the white. So we'll have to go out of the manifold and do crimp on the manifold, go over like an inch, and then do a crimp to an expansion, two fittings together, and then we can use expansion. But uh, again, let me know what you guys think. Why do I need to shut that down? Why is it important? Why can't I just spend $5 on a manifold, throw heat throughout here, and then bring it on back? Now it will be interesting out here how long it's gonna take to heat up. The game plan is, is the hot will run down this side of the garage, all three of those lines, and then all three of the lines turn in front of the garage doors. And then the, the first run obviously goes all the way there, like back and forth. The middle one comes out and goes through the middle. And then the last hot run goes out and then comes on back over here to the manifold. So uh, the hot pipes are going to be out towards the garage door. And when I was talking to one of you guys, Steve again, thanks for the call. Thanks for constantly hitting me up and talking to me. Um, he mentions that the concrete is going to stay so warm that even though we have a two foot apron on the outside, uh, those three hot pipes running through this way are gonna be so warm and that concrete's gonna get so warm that it'll actually transfer the heat all the way out to that apron and the apron actually won't ever have ice on it and it will constantly melt the snow even though we are talking about two feet or more distance between the, the very first hot pipe going out. But the interesting thing is, is gonna be is are the pipes back here ever gonna get warm? Because if you guys remember, when we poured the floor, I didn't get my taper right on my like stone that I had laid down. And then of course I laid down the uh, uh, two inch foam and then the PEX tubing and then the vapor barrier. And we couldn't just rip all that up one day. And again, the, the taper was not correct. So to end at five and a half inches on the apron outside, to get this floor to taper about an eighth of an inch uh, per foot, which as, obviously, as you can see, is working great because the water from Aaron's car, because it's raining, obviously has been going outside. Um, we had to pour a little bit more concrete than anticipated. Back here in the back, I think we have almost nine to 10 inches of concrete and those PEX tubings are nine inches below that concrete. So those tubes are gonna take probably all winter long to be able to heat that concrete up that thickness. But out here, the, the PEX tubes are only about five, five and a half inches below. So out here will get really, really hot. Out here, it'll take probably forever to heat up that much concrete. But that's all I got out here. So that's the game plan out here. We'll eventually connect those up. Guys, just let me know, should I go with a $5 PEX? $14 copper, uh, $70 copper with uh, on-off valves, or 200 for those like crazy looking manifolds with a gallon per minute flow rate and all that crap. All right, now headed down into the basement. We're gonna talk about the system down here real quick. And again, uh, Steve was pretty confident that it's amazing how well his garage heats with Radiant Floor, with New Dura, uh, he's got 15 foot ceilings, he says, and I can't remember his square footage, but he said he also has three runs uh, at like 300 feet. So I'm gonna say his garage is probably somewhere around 900 to 1,000 square feet also. So the fact that he can get away with that much heat and warmth and comfort in there and with tall ceilings, I'm almost wondering just how good it's gonna be down here 
to heat all of this concrete up and then to have all of that heat transfer up through this completely opened, I think this is four and a half inches by almost 17 feet or four and a half feet by 17 feet with such a massive hole right here all of this heat down in here can come up into the first floor and i'm just wondering again how well we can heat up in here now of course we've got uh probably 10 and a half feet to the concrete up to about subfloor level here we've got another 10 and a half feet from subfloor up to all of the flat ceilings and then we've got 16 and a half feet to get up to the peak so I'm gonna go ahead and say after about 36, 37, 38 feet, whatever that is, to heat all the way up to the peak up there, I'm gonna say that it's probably gonna be pretty cold up there at the peak because you're, you're trying to transfer heat up 30 some feet. I would imagine it would cool down and then you know start to fall back down before the heat could ever rise up to that peak. But I don't know, it'll be interesting to see again, ICF house, so well insulated, and uh, we've got this big open hole that heat's just gonna be pumping out through here. I just wonder how warm it actually is gonna be up here where we actually don't have to run radiant floor heat for the first floor. Now, I would imagine there are gonna be probably some cold spots, like let's say over in the corner over there or over in the corner over here, because down in the basement, we will one day obviously completely drywall this ceiling and I was going to insulate all of the cavities uh, in between the floor joists because if we were running radiant floor tubes under here, um, you want to pack in insulation under the tubes so it forces all the heat to transfer up onto the subfloor. But uh, if you put the insulation and the drywall, then of course, the furthest the way that you get away from that stair opening, like uh, in the dining room over in this corner, then that floor is not going to be too warm because even though you're pumping up heat right here going up to the joists well when you're blocking it off with insulation and drywall plus the three-quarter inch subfloor well that corner probably is not going to get too warm but again all in time that we just have to see how it's going to go after like our first winter uh, as soon as I get the doors on and the two windows uh, we get the drywall ceiling on we insulate up on the first floor and then basically we turn the sucker on and see what actually happens all right, back in the utility room, uh, kind of the same thing going on. Manifolds, are we gonna go ahead and pay for cheap or all the way expensive? The basement, I really don't see a point in doing zones. I just see that all of this concrete is connected. It's all thermally one unit. So why wouldn't we just heat the entire basement at one temperature? Now that is gonna suck because we've got a gym right in here. That is gonna suck that if this floor is the same temperature as the bedrooms, as the vault, as the main living area, well, you're gonna be working out and basically just sweating your butt off because it's just gonna be so incredibly hot as opposed to being maybe comfortable in the bedroom or being comfortable in the basement. So maybe I might get zone valves for the hot uh, and it depends which way we go. I think these tubes over here are transitioning it out through the utility room and then going all down through the gym. So if those are the hot pipes, the gym is gonna be crazy hot. But the pipes on the left over there are coming back, which are running all the way down the back wall, which means all six of those pipes are returning from the vault area, which means the vault is gonna be extremely hot. So it just depends which way we want more comfort to go uh, as the hot pipes come out and then as the cold pipes come back in. So maybe we will sacrifice the vault and keep the gym a little bit cooler because again, even if the gym was too hot and we started shutting down one of those runs that uh, the main line of the gym is going through, even though all six lines are going through this way, um, if you did clamp it off and slow down the water flow that would keep the gym a little bit cooler uh, or the vault going out, I don't know. It just depends, I'm no expert, but that's just my thought process for right now. And now we need to talk about everything that we're going to use. So like I said, Steve made me a list. So for right now, we haven't bought much. Uh, this is just stuff that I needed anyway, but really we just have a pressure relief valve 
set at 30 PSI. So if the boiler runs away and it's too hot, that thing's gonna blow open. We've got gauges that unfortunately with everything they had at the store, it was just a nightmare trying to find everything to fit and work. So many things are sold out and just not coming back. So we went with uh, a brass tee in the gas department. Uh, it wasn't even over by the PEX. The gauge obviously needs a reducer, which was annoying to find. And then we had to have uh, two of these come together because they don't make the this size three quarter inch PEX into a half inch internal. It's, uh, they, they go from three quarter to half inch, but they don't go f the opposite way. So I uh, had to buy a little spacer here to put in there that the threads fit. So that is obviously a temperature and pressure gauge. So we can see the water going out and the water coming back in for what those are at. And then we just got a strainer Y fitting that inside of there can catch things if uh, the system's ever breaking down. Um, I think we may go on the cheap route and go with cast iron uh, pumps. So if the cast iron's breaking down, this little strainer in here can catch uh, basically rust debris. And again, we've got the uh, three quarter inch expansion fittings on that and we'll hook that up somewhere. And that's all the store had. So everything else I have to buy on Supply House. So we're looking at uh, two pumps one pump to sit somewhere like say over here and go out to the garage, another pump over here. But again, I wanna hear what you guys think on uh, what size pump we need. I think for the garage, because it's only three runs under 900 feet, I think we can get away with a 125th horsepower pump. But I don't think a 125 horsepower pump can work on six runs, again, all under 300 feet because it's double uh, the amount of pumping, and I, I don't know. I just don't know if a 125th horsepower pump will do that. Unfortunately, Supply House's next pump, at least from the Grundfuss, goes all the way up to a 1/6th horsepower. So that is a crazy amount of pumping for what I think is probably overkill. So just curious if anyone knows anything on that. Should I step away from Grundfuss and find someone else if I'm gonna do a 125th or should I do like a 1 8 a 1 12th or a 1 15th pump for these six over here? And then everything else in my shopping cart just has to do with what we need. We've got a, a water air separator that will sit at the highest elevation, which I believe has to sit higher than any of the manifolds. So out here in the garage, I think those manifolds will be somewhere up right about here. So the air water separator will have to be up here somewhere. We've got the expansion tank, bracket, some fittings. We're going with a SR Taco controller and that's not using any individual zone valves. That's just a controller that can tell, hey, pump, turn on, start pumping. Same thing over here pump, turn on, and we'll go ahead and get a controller that has three zones. So if we do decide to do the, the first floor, we will have a controller that can hook up to one more thermostat. And again, thermostat hits a uh, temperature, calls for heat. It goes to the controller, controller goes to the pump and says, hey, start pumping out to the garage. So we've got, again, all of that, the thermostats, the controller, and everything kind of sitting by. And I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I'll need. And then from there, we'll figure out how to basically put this uh, massive puzzle together. So that's all I got for you guys. That, that's my thought process. Uh, again, I want to hear the comments before I start making huge purchases on stuff. This stuff was only a couple bucks, not a big deal. And again, I needed all that stuff there anyway. So it was only a couple hundred bucks at the store. So again, let me know what you guys think. Is there something that I'm missing? Is there something that I need? Should I go with good manifolds? Should I go with not good manifolds? Should I change out pump horsepower sizes, etc.? And again, the entire system will be three quarters of an inch necking down to half inch, which I think should be fine for such small runs and not that many, uh, uh, well, not even really any zones, um, but just six runs, three runs, etc. And uh, let me know what you guys think. So again, short video, wrapping it up here. Let me see some comments and then uh, we'll see you guys next time when I got a few more videos planned for you. So until then, take care and we'll see you all next time.